All right, Psalm. Psalm 9 is, is actually one of the longer psalms, at least for what we've been doing lately. And um, there's not quite as much of a variety of different things that we'll be covering in this passage. There's one main theme of, of you know, God being a judge and judging righteously, and those that are oppressed and those that are poor and needy can rest and trust and hope in their, in their God, and the wicked are going to be judged. And that's actually a common theme throughout the Psalms. There's a lot of songs written like that, and which makes perfect sense that there are a lot of songs that we would sing to give us comfort, to give us hope, to, to give us um, a, a sense of not being alone, and we're going to be singing to God uh, songs like this to help lift our spirits and to increase our faith. So that is one of the reasons why you'll find a, a similar theme throughout various psalms. Now let's dig into the Psalm 9 here. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Now, I haven't covered this a whole lot. I know that these subjects were going to be coming up in the, in the future psalms. I'm going to deal with it tonight in the, in the subject of just singing in church and singing praises to God, especially in church, but not even just in church, but any point in your life, around the house, at home, being able to sing praises unto God and not doing it feignedly, not faking it. A lot of people, and look, I, I am guilty of this. When I would go to church, when I was, especially when I was a child, when I was younger and I was forced to go to church, I would go to church. And if I had to sing, usually I wouldn't sing very much, but if I had to sing, normally what I would do is I would just kind of mouth the words. I would just move my mouth and not let very much noise come out of my mouth. And I wouldn't be singing and I wouldn't be praising God. I would just be kind of reading and looking and doing as little as I possibly could to where if someone looked at me, they might think I was singing because there's enough people singing to be able to drown out any noise that I might make. And that's not right. And I had this same type of an attitude even later when I would go and visit, even after, you know, after I got saved and I started going to churches, I was pretty self-conscious and I didn't like to, to sing out. Now, I love music and I love to sing, but when no one else is around or no one else is, is there to hear, but I would never sing praises to God, even when I was by myself. That's not something that I did. I, I was, you know, for a long time, I was into worldly music. And before I ever started singing hymns or singing praises at home or on my own, I started by singing them in church. And we notice here in Psalm 9, verse number 1, the Bible says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. He's all about praising God, and he has his heart in what he's singing. Because that's important. It's a whole point of seeing where you know, a song is different than a reading. It's different than standing up and reading scripture out loud, which is obviously what we're doing here. But the Psalms are set to music and a praise unto the Lord. Yes, you can praise God by just stating words. But this is a specific type of praise where we're doing it in song and singing unto the Lord. And when we praise, when we sing praises unto God, we ought to be singing with our whole heart. Be singing out loud. Be singing and not caring what other people think around you because it doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter. It's not for them. When you sing praises unto God, it is not for anyone else around you as much as it is for God. Now keep your place here in Psalm 9. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 13. This is something that I believe everybody ought to do. This was lacking in my life for a long time, but I thank God that I got right with God by singing these praises because I love the hymns. I love praising God, and there are so many times in our lives that God is totally worthy of praise. I mean, God is always worthy of praise. God is always worthy of praise, but there are so many times where you want to express your feeling of love towards God and just exalting God's name and thanking him for his goodness and his long suffering and his mercy and his judgment and all of the attributes of God and being able to praise God. It is a great way to do that in song. Hebrews 13, hopefully you got to Hebrews 13. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse number 15, by him therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise 
to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Giving God, it's calling this a sacrifice of praise. It's something that you're offering unto God. It's something that you're giving up to God. I'm giving my voice to you, Lord. I'm willing to sing out and praise your name. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The Bible calls that a sacrifice of praise. And for some people, it may be harder than others. And I know I was one of them, but I, I thank God that I got right this. And if you are one of them, if you are one that doesn't normally sing in church, you don't normally sing out loud, you don't follow along, you don't grab your songbook, you don't open it up, and you don't start singing the songs that we sing in church, you ought to get right. God Require, God wants the singing. God wants to hear that from his children. And I know this much. And I know that we're made in the image of God. And I know there's a lot of things that we understand about God. And there's, you know, God's not a sinner. We do have a sin nature, but we also have a spirit. We also have things. And God has, has created us in a way to help us, I think, to help better understand him. And I know that when I hear my children sing, I hear them sing at home, I hear them sing songs, it lifts my own heart. It gives me a warmth. It gives me a comfort just hearing their little voices. Now, they're not all able to carry a tune the way that a professional singer can carry a tune. They don't always hit the right notes, but you know what? That sounds great to me. Being their father, I love hearing their, their, their voices sing. And I can guarantee you that our Father in heaven... If you're born again, he wants to hear you singing praises and not just singing. See, my, my children sing. I love to hear them sing. Sometimes they just make up their own songs. I like hearing their voices. But what I love even more is when they're singing hymns and when they're singing praises to God. And that just warms my heart. And, and I could tell you, I, I believe that God's heart is warmed when we sing praises unto him and we're, we're actually exalting his name and telling God how great he is. God loves to hear that. God loves to hear that from his creation that he gave a free will to where it's our choice to do these things, where, where no, one, no one's forcing you to do it. But it's up to us. And that's, you know, on a side note, since it's, it's related to this, this is one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people get into this Calvinist thinking and... People ask questions. I was actually out sewing a couple weeks ago, and, and someone asked me the question about why, well, why are there so many bad, you know, it's hard to believe in a God when so many bad things happen. And it's a pretty easy, you know, argument to debunk, to say that, well, God doesn't exist because bad things happen. It's, that doesn't make any sense. But one of the ways that I like to answer that is say, well, you know, it's not God causing things to happen. It's man that's doing that. That's not God. It's not his will that's, that's doing all of the wicked, evil things that are going on in this world. The, the pedophiles and the people who are just totally violating other people. God's not making that happen. You say, well, why doesn't God prevent that? Well, God's capable of preventing things from happening, but just, just think about this. If, you, if God were to prevent every single thing bad from ever happening then would we even really have free will if it was just always, if you'd never had an opportunity to do something? You wouldn't. And the concept of free will, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this because it really is an entire sermon in and of itself and proving that God has given us free will from the Bible. But you can just get a real quick understanding that we have a free will just by reading the Old Testament, you know, the law that talks about the different offerings that are made and the sacrifices for sin all you have to do is look up the free will offering to see that there is a concept of free will given in the Bible where the free will offering was not mandatory for anybody to do. The instructions were given on how to offer the free will offering, but guess what? The free will offering was based on your own free will. If you chose to give thanks to God and to give an offering because you want to, then you can do that. Now, why in the world, if God didn't give us a free will, a will to choose what we want to do or what we want to think or anything like that, then why would there be such a thing as a free will offering in God's perfect word? It doesn't make any sense. 
But beyond that, my, my explanation in speaking with this person, you know, if God intervened every single time that something bad was going to happen, then there, that would eliminate free will. And you ask, well, why did God even give us free will? Why didn't he just make us to be perfect? I said, well, God did make, a, make everything perfect in the beginning, in the creation. When he, when in the book of Genesis, when he created the, the animals and the seas and the land, and he created Adam and Eve, and he created the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. And there was no evil, and there was no wickedness, and there was no sin. God made everything good, but he also made man with a free will to decide what he wants to do, to even to the point of deciding whether or not he wants to listen to God. And because of that, because of that free will, and because of those choices, and because of bad choices that man made, not God, we find ourselves in the situation we are. We see that sin exists, and, sin and wickedness exists. And it's not God's fault for doing that. But you say, well, what is the motive for God even making free will to begin with? Well, the motive, I think, is pretty easy. You think about where we're at today technologically and the advances and, and what mankind is able to create. Mankind is able to create a lot of interesting things. And um, you know, one of those things may be being these robots or machines that are able to, to look like a person or act like a person and do certain things. But I'll tell you what, those things that they do, like now they have these, it's, it's really bizarre. I saw some article on this where they have these, these robots that are meant to be like a girlfriend for, for a guy or something like that where, where you can even, and, and I'm not sure if this is happening yet. It probably is. Everything's so twisted anyways, where people are marrying these robots and they're designing these things to be, oh, your perfect mate, this perfect person to have with you. And it's really bizarre and really twisted and really perverted. It just shows you the depths of depravity that, that mankind is facing when people are thinking that that would even be okay or, or normal at all to have such a bizarre thing as, as having a machine as a spouse. But one thing that, that man does not do and cannot do is create life. Man is very good at, at creating tools and instruments and, and machines and things that can do what we tell it to do. And I understand this. I'm a computer programmer. I'm able to, to understand how to write code and, and, and to give instructions unto a machine to have it do something that I want it to do. But at the end of the day, the machine always does what I instruct it to do. Even if you instruct it to, to do some random stuff, well, it still has a, a set of instructions that it's pulling randomly from. There's still a limit as to what these machines can do. And if you have a machine that's going to tell you every day when you come home, oh, I love you, how was your day at work? Well, guess what? It's programmed to do that. It's designed to do that every time, and that's all you're ever going to get. What level of love do you think you could ever actually possibly feel from a machine that just tells you what it's been programmed to tell you. It doesn't have a heart. It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't actually feel anything and can't tell you something because it chooses to want to love you or do anything nice for you. You cannot get the same. You, you cannot receive anything, uh, any type of, of good feeling or, or understanding of love when it's just been programmed that way. But see, God gave us a free will. He lets us choose. He tells us all about himself. He tells us he's a God of justice. He tells us the things that he hates. He tells us the things that he loves. He tells us how he's, offer, he's offering us a free ticket to heaven through Jesus Christ. He's demonstrated his love for us. He wants us to be with him, but... Through all of that, he doesn't force us to do so. And he gives us this will to be able to sacrifice back unto him and to show a love for him that he did not automatically create us to do. And don't buy into the lie of Calvinism and the limited atonement and the the. God creating people, some people to be damned and some people to be saved, and that God's sovereignly in charge of absolutely everything that goes on in this world, and, and every single thing that happens is because that's the way God wants it to happen. That's wicked, 
That's not scriptural, and that goes against uh, that goes against who God is. God gave us a will. That's why in this verse number one of Psalm nine, I will praise thee, O Lord. I will. It's my will to praise you, O God. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. The praise that's being done is with his whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. There's so many reasons to praise God. Look at verse number two. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. We ought to be singing praises to God. God is worthy of it. And it ought to be something that comes from your heart. And like I said earlier, don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry, oh, I don't have a very good singing voice. You do to God. And that's what matters. And I'll tell you what, even when, I'm, when I go to other churches and I sit in, in the pews, I don't care. I'm not judging how everyone sounds by the sound of their voice, but I'll tell you what I'm encouraged by. I'm encouraged by a church where everybody's singing. Where everybody's lifting up their voice and singing on the Lord with their whole heart. That's encouraging. Amen. I love that. There's something special about being in a church service where people show how much they love God by their singing, not because they're trying to show off to other people, but because they love, love God and they're singing with their heart unto the Lord. And you know, and it makes you be edified even more knowing, hey, I'm around a whole bunch of people that love God. I'm around a bunch of people that are singing to God with their whole heart. What a great feeling. What a great experience to be a part of. We keep reading here in Psalm 9. We're going to see now why, he, why he's so joyful. Why, what, what, why am I going to sing praises? Why am I going to sing with my whole heart? Why that desire is there. Uh, continuing on here in Psalm 9, verse number 3 says, When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. So why is he so happy? Well, from verse 3, it's because of justice. It's because of the wicked people and the evildoers. My enemies are getting what's, what's coming to them. And there's nothing wrong with being happy about that. When, when, the right, when justice is served, when the right thing happens, it amazes me that anyone would think that you shouldn't be happy when justice is served. Everyone, I believe, has the, uh, uh, an innate instinct just to understand that, hey, when someone does wrong to you, that's not right and something ought to be done about it. Now, unfortunately, some people like to take matters in their own hands, and unfortunately, we have governments around the world that don't judge properly and don't actually execute justice that's deserved. And then there's other things that aren't even really should be crimes that people get punished for. So everything gets all screwed up. But the desire to wanting things to be made right, I mean, when someone steals from you, it's not a wicked thought to say, man, I hope that person gets caught so I get my stuff back. And that person ought to be punished for what they've done because that's not right. It's not right to violate someone else. Justice ought to be served. But today, people have this distorted view of Christianity. They say, oh, oh, you want something bad to happen to somebody? Yeah, I want justice to be served. And justice being served doesn't have anything to do with salvation, by the way. Because people always want to turn it into that and say, oh, well, don't you a sinner too? Didn't you ever do anything wrong? Yeah, I have done things wrong. And you know what? When I do do things wrong, I expect to be punished for those things. And I will not refuse to be punished for the things that I do wrong because that is what is right. That is justice. Now, when it comes to our salvation, thank God that God has forgiveness for our sins. Because Jesus Christ paid the punishment, but even through that forgiveness, it's not that the sins don't go unpunished. Because they were punished. They were already given, the punishment was given to Jesus Christ. So God, as a God of justice, made sure that everything is paid for. That every single sin has a payment. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. 
Thou sattest in the throne, judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. So these verses 3 through 6, we here we see, you know, right after he gets done, say, oh, I'm going to sing, I'm going to sing with my whole heart. We see all this judgment coming upon the heathen, excuse me, upon the wicked. And God sitting in his throne and judging. Yes, we all be happy when God judges because God is just. God is right. God is true. And when God comes in and judges, it's a good thing. Now, I love this, this term here. In verse number six, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. What does the word perpetual mean? It means ongoing. It means like everlasting. And what does that word end means? End means something stops. So you say, well, how does that even make sense? It's a perpetual end. Well, what that means is that if you think of the end, something can come to an end, but then, you know, can, can start up again and happen and come to an end. And what he's saying here, what, what comes to an end are destructions, right? So the enemy, the heathen, people who are wicked, can go from destruction to destruction. They can take one person, they could, they could assault somebody and beat them up and maybe kill them. And then that destruction stops against that person. And they could turn to somebody else and have a new destruction that comes to an end and then go to a new destruction. So you can see how there could be like this cycle and you could have destruction after destruction after destruction and each one can have an end. But what he's talking about here is a perpetual and he's saying the destructions are all going to stop. They won't happen anymore. It's going to be done forever. It's a perpetual end. They will never start again. It will never come up again. Per the destruction will be done. There will be no more destruction by calling it a perpetual end. But what I like about this concept as well, and I think that's what this verse is teaching, is that it just ended once and for all. And, and that is going to happen where destruction is ended once and for all at the great white throne judgment where God is sitting on his throne. And that's what this is describing, I think, in at least in one sense. God sits on his throne, the great white throne judgment, after the millennial reign of Christ, after Satan is loosed out of hell and deceives the nations, Gog and Magog, and they turn against God and God destroys them. And then the new heaven or the, the old heaven and the old earth pass away and everyone is standing before the judgment seat and God judges the dead the unsaved out of the books of the law and God judges them and casts them into the lake of fire. And that's where Satan also goes, where the beast and the false prophet are. They're cast off into the lake of fire. This is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that's when destructions are come to a perpetual end. And that perpetual end is a concept that you know, the, the cults, especially the Jehovah's False Witnesses, don't believe in. And it's a concept they don't understand, but it's a concept that is taught throughout the Bible because the perpetual end or perpetual death exists. That's why the place, the lake of fire, is called the second death. Because the people there are dead, but they still exist. That's why the people that were delivered up, the dead that were delivered up out of the sea and the de dead that were delivered up out of hell, they are the dead. They do not have everlasting life, but they were delivered up and they exist. Their soul exists. It's not alive. It's dead. But the feeling is still there. The consciousness is still there. The understanding is still there. The soul is still there, but they're considered dead. And they go to a perpetual end. A perpetual death. An end that lasts forever. A death that lasts forever. It is not a death that is just, oh, you're incinerated and then you cease to exist and there's no memory and no concept of that person ever again. No, that's not the way it works. And this is for that reason, for that very reason alone. That's why it's so imperative that people get off their rear ends and people that have the gospel of Jesus Christ to go out and warn other people about it. Because people think it's a big joke these days, 
But it's not a joke. It's a reality. Hell's real. The lake of fire is real. And people are going to be burning and tortured and tormented forever and ever and ever. And they're going to have no rest day nor night. It is going to continue and last as a perpetual end. Going back to Psalm 9, verse number 7. The Bible reads, But the Lord shall endure forever. The destructions end in a perpetual end, but God endures forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. I remind you, this is a song. It's powerful. I love that about these songs. I love that about the Psalms. They're packed with doctrine. They're so powerful, and yet it's still a song. Completely unlike the songs that come out these days, the modern Christian contemporary music that you hear is so much fluff and so little doctrine and not packed with the meat of God's word. And this is great. We see this here. God is also going to be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. He's going to judge. Yeah, imagine, imagine a song coming out these days in Christian contemporary music talking about God judging people. Yeah, right. You're not going to sell albums that way. Which is why you'll never hear it. Because that's, they, they care about selling albums. And that's it. That's why you have generic songs on the Christian radio. They talk about love and God and feeling good and being close to Him and whatever these songs are about that any, any religion could listen to and not have a problem with it. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Verse number 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Now, I'm going to be going into this concept. Keep your place here in Psalm 9. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. In a few weeks, when we get to Psalm 14, I'm going to go into this concept a little bit more in depth. Psalm 14, as well as Psalm 53, are... Um, Basically, it's almost the same psalm, and it's talking about how um, it's, it's the verse that's quoted in Romans chapter 3, about there's, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that understandeth, no, not one. And, and, and that's quoting Psalm 14 or Psalm 53. So in a few weeks, when we get to Psalm 14, I'm going to cover this more in depth, but I just want to... Throw this out there and, and, and show you this. Um, you know, obviously, here in verse 10 of Psalm 9, he's saying, They that know thy name will put their trust in thee. That's being saved. We put your trust in God. We, 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 we call on the name of the Lord. We trust him. We know his name. We trust in him. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. So, are there people that seek God? Yes. And God doesn't forsake those that seek him. Matthew 7, verse number 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And then turn, if you would, real quick to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This concept came up last week, I believe it was. And, um, you know, I was talking about this with someone else and it's regard to salvation. And, again, another, another soul winning example. It wasn't, I wasn't out soul winning. I was talking to someone who was. And, you know, people always love to bring up the example of, well, what about that lost tribe in Africa or those people that don't know, you know, how, can, is God just going to send them to hell? And, you know, kind of judging the righteousness of God. Where the Bible said, where Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But a lot of people have a hard time with that, and they'll think that God is unjust, even though Jesus said he's the only way, and that there's absolutely no way to get to heaven without Jesus Christ. 
And there's none other name under heaven given among men, among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, you need to know Jesus Christ in order to be saved and go to heaven. People are just trying to say, oh, well, what if someone believes in God and they're just trusting in him and they don't know his name, they don't know anything about him, but they just, they're just calling out and saying, I, I, God, I, you know, can they be saved? Are they saved? No, no, they're not saved because they need Jesus to be saved. They need to call on the name of the Lord. They need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Well, how is that just? Well, that's just. That goes back to the free will argument. Someone brought them to that place. And look, I, I still, and this is all just assuming that there are people where no one has ever gone to give the gospel to at all. I don't believe that there is such a place. I really don't. But if someone chooses to pick up and just move completely into isolation away from everybody and barricade himself in, that's a choice that they make. And they can damn themselves and their own families to hell in, by doing that. But I believe that there's a chance there. And I also believe this, though. I, I believe this firmly is that when there is someone that wants to know the truth, that wants to know about God, that God will send a minister by whom they might believe. And that God appoints people to go and preach the gospel. And I think, and, and one of the reasons why I think this, and think this so strongly, if you're in Hebrews chapter 11, I want you to look at verse number 6. The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So God rewards those that diligently seek him. There are people who want to know about God. Now, not everyone, excuse me, accepts God for who he is, accepts scripture, accepts what the Bible says. But there are people that want to know God, and God will make himself known to those that, that seek after him. I was one of those people. For a long time, I didn't care. I didn't really think about it very much, but around the time, around my between my nine, when I was 19 years old, 20 years old, right around that time frame. I got saved when I was 20, but probably when I was 19, I started to really search and I wanted to know what's, what's true, what's right. And, you know, there was enough around me to say, God exists. There's enough evidence in this life to, to help you to understand that God is real. I, didn't, I wasn't a fool that said in my heart, there is no God. I believed in God, but I didn't know who God was, and I didn't know what to believe, so I searched. So I sought for God. I didn't, I didn't seek to see, is there a God? I sought for God. And I believe that God made himself known unto me by, by directing me in the right ways or leading people to me is probably a more accurate way to say it, leading someone to me to where since I was actively seeking, I was going to events, I was trying to find out what the truth was, that God made path, my path cross with, uh, with a minister by whom I received the word of God and that seed being sown in my heart came to fruition when I called on the name of the Lord. And I see that happening and I think that I believe this, that people who are, um, that do seek God, God will, will send something. Now, again, there's still up to the person to go out sowing. It's up to the person to preach the word. It's, it's not God's fault, but God is still sending people because he wants people to be saved. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 9. Like, and as I said, I'm going to cover that in, a little bit more in depth when we get into Psalm 14. Um, because that's, that's another false doctrine that Calvinist teaches that it's impossible. It's impossible for a man to please God. So how can someone who's unsaved please God by believing in Jesus Christ? And that's just sheer stupidity. But, but I'll, I'll unravel that dumb argument when we go through Psalm 14 because it's actually very pertinent to that scripture. So let's go back to Psalm 9, verse number 11. The Bible says, Sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. 
Declare among the people his doings. That's an imperative statement. Declare, telling you to declare, it's telling you to speak, it's telling you to say, hey, you ought to be declaring among the people God's doings. You ought not to be afraid about declaring, letting your light shine, not hiding it under a bushel, not being afraid because you might lose your job, not being afraid because you might lose your friends, not being afraid because, oh, people are going to treat me different, but declaring among the people his doings. Why? Because we're not ashamed of the Lord. We're happy that, the God, that God is who he is. We're happy about his judgment. We're going to sing praises to his name, and we're going to declare among the people his doings. Verse number 12, when he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. And this is what's being explained here about God's character and who God is and why we should be so happy about the things of God. Because in this world, you see the poor people, you see people who don't have uh, any money, you see people who have, who have been afflicted and who get forgotten and left in the gutter and left to die and nobody seems to care. And you've got the wicked people oppressing the poor and oppressing people throughout this world. And it seems like no justice ever happens. Nothing's being done about it. But praise God, you know what? Those cries for help of the poor and the needy and the persecuted don't fall on deaf ears. Not with God. God makes sure that all the wrongs are righted. God makes sure that the wickedness and the evildoer get punished. And if you don't see it happening in this life, guess what? You'll see it when they get tossed into the lake of fire. Because everyone will be there. Justice will be served. And God hears the cry of the humble, as it says here in verse number 12. Look at verse number 13. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. And you'll see this oftentimes this is the way that God works and is the way that life works. You know, the Bible tells us that we reap what we sow, that whatsoever a man sow, be not deceived, God is not mock. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the people that are out there laying traps and laying snares and trying to catch people and trap them and, and hurt them oftentimes are going to end up falling into their own traps, falling into their own net that they make. They cover up a ditch and they cover it and they're falling. They're the ones falling into the ditch and getting hurt by it. This truth is found multiple times in scripture. So don't ever be deceived. Don't ever be deceived into doing evil or setting traps for people. And I don't care if you think you're justified. I don't care if you think there's a good reason for this and you're going to be deceitful and you're going to work in guile and you're going to set this trap and you're going to spring this trap on someone and you're going to catch them and snare them. Guess what? You don't have to take those matters in your own hand. Let God deal with it. Because when you go around setting traps for people, when you go around working in guile and deceitfully, it's going to come back and bite you. Jacob worked deceitfully. Jacob wanted a blessing. Jacob tricked his father into giving him a blessing. Well, what happened to Jacob? He was deceived. The one thing that he really wanted when he wanted to marry Rachel, he was deceived and was given Leah instead of Rachel. It comes back. You reap what you sow. Look at verse number 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. A guy on Selah. I love this verse. The Lord is known. You want to know God? The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. You want to know God? Take a look at his judgments. It'll give you a great idea about who God is when you see how he judges. When you see, wow, 
when you read God's law, and turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 4, but when you see how God feels about things, when you see the commandments that God has given, when you see how God feels about the predator, when you see how God feels about the thief, by the judgments he commands, by the punishments he commands, when you see how God feels about someone who steals another person, when you see how God feels about the sodomite, the homosexual, the person that lies with mankind as he lies with womankind, and when he, when he puts a death sentence upon that, it gives you some insight into who God is. He's known by the judgment which he executes. And not only from the evildoers, but when God executes judgment by giving justice upon the evildoers and rewarding the righteous. God is known. That makes God known. And praise God for who he is. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I've preached on this multiple times, but I love this connection here. I think people are, are forgetting this. And people have this, this concept of not wanting to Look and, and love the law of the Lord and take wisdom and guidance and instruction from God's laws and know who God is and know how he wants us to be and how we ought to feel towards these things and not become tolerant of these things. When God tells us what his judgments are, that is what righteousness is. And if you want to know God, you can know God by his judgments. Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. This is Moses speaking unto the children of Israel, saying, God gave me these commandments, and I've taught them unto you, so you ought to do them. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations." This is how God is going to be known among all the nations when you have these righteous laws and you keep them and you do them. That is going to make God known. And the other nations are going to see that and they're going to see, wow, how wise and understanding this people is because they have such justice. They have such righteous laws that people know down in their heart is right. When the little child is defiled by the homosexual predator and they get put to death, that is justice. And everybody knows that deep down inside that they ought to be hung. There ought to be no pity for them. They ought to be put to death. And when people could see that you have a law in place like that, they're going to say, that's a wise people. They understand the way things ought to be because it's God's judgment. And when they see God's judgment, they're going to see and hear the statutes. I'm going to read there in verse number six. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great? who hath God so nigh unto them, that means so close unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? God's law is a righteous law. Don't you ever back down to the God-hating pervert that wants to tear down God's laws and judge God and judge you for loving God and loving his laws because they think it's wicked, because they think that God's law is not righteous and not perfect when it is. And shame on you, Christian, if you don't stand up for right and wrong based on what God's word says. Don't ever be, a, you have no reason to be ashamed of God's word. You have no reason to be ashamed of his law. His laws are righteous. And if you don't understand it, then that's your fault. But don't judge God for being wicked for what his law says. Because God's law is righteous. Let's go back to Psalm 9. Look at verse number 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell. And you know what? That's another one of God's judgments. And it's righteous. It's right. And we ought to love the fact that God created a hell for people to go to and pay for their punishment. 
Now, we're trying to save people from that. We love people. But in the end, when everything is said and done, everybody standing before that judgment seat is going to get what's coming to them, and it's going to be right. It's going to be appropriate. It's going to be justice being served. And I don't care what the Jehovah's wit false witnesses say, and I don't care if they say, well, how could a loving God, if God is love, how could anyone go to hell? Because God loves those that were afflicted by the wicked doers. That's why. And God has justice and judgment. And he's right. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Let's keep reading here. Psalm 9, verse number 18. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Why? Because that's the way things seem to be in this world now, doesn't it? That the needy are forgotten and the, the expectation of the poor it perishes pieces and that's not the way it's always going to be because God makes things right. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. A righteous person, someone who's right with God is going to have this type of an attitude. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Bring the judgment, Lord because it's righteous, and we thank you for being a God of justice and a God of judgment. Verse number 20, last verse. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Now turn, if you would, to Ezekiel 28. It's the last place I'll have you turn tonight. Ezekiel 28. People need to be put in fear. There is a healthy fear of the Lord that people ought to have. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. How are people going to be put into fear? When judgment comes. I wish some of the nations that have been judged by God would see the judgment for what it is and get right. Now, I'm not saying that every single time there's any disaster ever in the world that it's God's judgment, but I'll tell you what, I would be looking at that a lot. Like when a wicked place like New Orleans gets wiped out with a, with a massive hurricane, we ought to be looking and saying, you know what, God is really powerful and God can cause a lot of destruction and people ought to take heed to themselves and not get caught up in so much wickedness and idolatry and perversion that goes on in, in, a, in a place like that. And they ought to fear. They ought to see what God can do, how God can destroy a place, how God can rain fire and brimstone down upon a nation, upon a city, upon a place. And they ought to fear when God can bring destruction, when judgment comes. The nations may know themselves to be but men. Pride is the reason why so many people do not come to Christ. Pride is the reason why so much destruction happens from the Lord is because men get lifted up in themselves and think themselves to be something more that they add. They are and put, <coughs> despise the name of the Lord don't care about God because they think that they're so great. And a reason behind much of the sin and the violence in the world is, is a proud attitude. The attitude that says that I'm better than everyone else. The person that thinks that they are so great and so mighty and so lifted up cares so much about themselves, they stop caring about other people. They think that, well... If it's going to benefit me, I don't care about anyone else. Why? Because they're full of themselves and they're willing to trample on people and to steal from the poor and to do whatever it takes to get themselves ahead. That is a proud attitude, but beware because pride cometh before destruction. Because God hates a proud look. The higher up you think of yourself, the more people will tend to forget that they're but men and not God. Nebuchadnezzar had this problem. Read the book of Daniel. He got so lifted up in himself, he looked at everything that happened that the, the, 
the power that was given unto him by the Lord in defeating all these various nations was not of his own strength, but he thought it was. And he got full of himself and saying, oh, wow, look at all this that I have done. Instead of giving the credit and glory unto God, and he was abased. He was brought very low because of his pride. And God turned him into, gave him a heart of an animal until he realized, I'm just a man. I'm not God. I'm not the one who's really ultimately in charge of everything here. I'm not. And people, we all need to have humility and understand that and not let any successes any achievements, any accomplishments go to our head to make us think that we're so much better than, than everybody else. And I'll tell you what, there's, there is no temptation taken to us of what is common to man. And it's funny because as I've been job hunting and stuff, uh, the, the skills that God has blessed me with, and the type of work that I can do, actually, I'm realizing has a, a large potential for, for uh, a high monetary compensation. And as my wife and I have been talking, she's like, you always you know, sell yourself short or, or you, can, you seem kind of down on yourself. But I just, I'm trying to be careful because I know what money can do and I know what, what having a large income can do. And I know that I don't want to be setting my, my heart and my desire on the things of this world and on the mammon of this world and, and not being rich towards God and not being focused on the area I really need to be focused on. Obviously, I need to provide for my family, but it's important to me that I don't ever allow myself because it, it, it can be easy to do. You start making a, a whole bunch of money. You start getting this really great job and a great salary. And you know what? People start to think, down on other people. And because you have all this money and other people don't, it, it's a way into to getting a proud heart and a proud look and you start thinking other people aren't quite as good as you because they don't make as much money as you. And that's wicked. That is a wicked thought and that's something that we ought to be running far away from. But look at Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to see this uh, th this concept, and that's why I, I wanted to go to this, is because the last verse in Psalm 9, verse 20 says, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. And we see a very similar phrase being used in Ezekiel 28, where uh, this prophecy comes against the prince or the king of Tyre, or of Tyrus is what it says here in Ezekiel. Now, I know there's a lot of, a lot of reference here to, I, th I think, to Satan as well, who's, who's truly the spiritual wickedness behind Tyre, but it's also to this king who's lifted up in himself and gets full of himself. Uh, look at verse number one. The Bible says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. In the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So here's someone, you know, Tyre was this very rich city. It, it was a port. There's a lot of uh, merchandise going back and forth and, and a lot of wealth to be made there. And you've got this king, this ruler in charge who is letting all of this get to his head. And he's become so foolish in his heart as to get lifted up in pride to the point where he's saying, I'm a God. Because let's face it, in this world, when you have a lot of money, there's a lot of power and influence that could go along with that. And you could make people do a lot of things because you, you have so much wealth and so much power to be able to influence people. And people will do anything and sell their souls for money. So you end up having a lot of control and power over people. And especially when you start using it in wicked ways, it's, it, it, it goes to your head to make you think. It's for, for a man, one of God's creations, to get to this point to think, wow, I have so much power over people, it's like I'm God. And that is scary wicked. That is, that is a terrifying thought, knowing who God is, for anyone to even say something like that or to believe that in their heart. This is really bad and something that everyone, I mean, we don't even want to come anywhere close to an attitude like this. 
because God will bring you low. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three, behold, and this is, I believe, reference to Satan. But behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. So if God has blessed you with riches, beware of this that your heart doesn't get lifted up. It's not always wickedness to have riches or to have wealth in this world. God may have blessed you for some reason to have wealth, but you better watch out that you don't allow that wealth and those riches to lift your heart up in pride. Verse 6, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? So he's saying, when all, when all this comes on you and you're going to be put to death, are you still going to have this proud attitude speaking to the person who's taking your life? Uh, but I'm God. You can't take my life away from me because I'm God. So you see the foolishness here because you really don't have the power that you think you do when you allow all these riches to go to your head and you think you're in control of everything. You're really not the day that your life is taken from you. But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. He say, because I made it happen. You think you're God? You think nothing can touch you? You think nothing can hurt you? You think you have so much power? Well, you're not going to be thinking you have so much power when the real God, when the true God, the Lord, comes and brings strangers upon you and takes your life from you. And he says, I'm the one that made that happen. I am God. I have the power that you thought you had. You don't have it. And God will bring you low. That alone, hey, that tells you who God is. We ought to sing praises to God for being so righteous and holy and for being a God of judgment and justice and, and, and also for being a God that is long-suffering long and merciful. But there's so much we learn about God through His judgments. Let's not avoid Him. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for the great truths that we learn from Your Word. God, I pray that You would please help us, that especially the people who who are, don't like singing maybe or don't normally sing to, uh, to learn to do it and, and to sing with their whole heart unto you and to just maybe ponder on, on some of the, your greatness and um, all the reasons there are for exalting your name and praising you in order to help their hearts get right so that they could pray or they could sing unto you with all their heart as well, dear Lord. I thank you for preserving your words for us and helping us understand who you are through your laws and your judgments, dear God. Help us to, um, to really take heed to your judgments and your law and help us to meditate on them regularly and to, um, to just keep making changes to our lives that we'd be more in accordance with your words. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.